Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are a call-in radio show for you to ask the questions you may have regarding maybe plant identification or problem solving, maybe diagnosis, something like that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu well let's see we've got some rain that's been going on around here haven't we and now it seems to have stopped for a little while i haven't checked the weather forecast to see when it's coming back uh, but i can tell you we got quite a bit and so that is always a time when we start uh paying attention to where we might have standing water. If you've got saggy gutters on the roof, maybe they don't fully drain out. Uh, maybe a bird bath in the backyard, the catch basins underneath your uh, container uh, plants on the patio, for example, or even, you know, just uh, other places where it can gather. You know, tires are notorious. Some old tire laying around catches water and you can't get it out of there. Well, all of those places are where mosquitoes can breed, and when mosquitoes have the opportunity to, they will uh, breed, and, and they, their life cycle is fast. So you ignore that for a couple of weeks, and you're going to have a mosquito problem. And so what we need to do is drain all those areas, make sure that there's not standing water. Mosquitoes like stagnant water. If the water is moving, they are not likely to... Uh, you know, reproduce well in that. So, but the stagnant water areas, especially with decaying organic matter, that is mosquito heaven. And so you want to drain all those areas. If it's an area you can't drain, then oh, it's real simple. You just get some mosquito dunks and put them in there. They come in the round little donuts. They also come in a granule form. Basically what that is, it's a natural disease of mosquito larva. So uh, you probably have heard of Bt that we spray on plants that are being eaten by caterpillars and the Bt when it's consumed by the caterpillar causes the caterpillar to die. It's a disease. Think of it that way as a caterpillar. It doesn't affect grasshoppers. It doesn't affect lady beetles. You know, it, all these other insects are not affected, just caterpillars. Well, there's a different strain of Bt that will kill mosquito larva. Don't use the caterpillar one. It won't work. But the one that kills mosquito larvae, it'll be labeled for that. It'll be called something like a mosquito dunk or you know, so on. Uh, you just toss those into the water and maybe you got a little pond, a stagnant pond. Toss those in. It'll last about a month. And any mosquitoes that hatch into larva uh, in that particular section of water are not going to make it. It'll take them out. So that's a simple, easy way to deal with it. And with all the rain we've had, the crop of mosquitoes is on verge of, of taking off and becoming a problem. Kind of spoils our late day outdoor uh, sit on the patio where we can relax and enjoy it. You know, we're swatting mosquitoes the whole time. Well, let's see. Our phone number, 979-845-5689. And we are going to go to the phones and talk to Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Skip. Uh, I have three questions for you if you have time. Okay. I'll start with the easiest one first. Uh, is there a morning glory type that will not reseed itself and become invasive? Not that I know of. Oh. <laughs> okay. Not not that I'm aware of. And, and uh, sorry, uh, but th I guess it's possible there's some out there, but I'm just, I'm not aware of them. Okay. Because uh, I love them, but they, they tend to take over with everything. Yeah, they can. Uh, next question is about young live oak trees. Uh, okay. so we, plant, we planted several probably about 10 years ago. They're doing great. Uh, they are thicker than a softball um, on, the, on the stem. My question is about lower branches that have popped out and are doing great, but they're like shin high. Mm -hmm. uh, should those be pruned off? Because when I drive around and see all the mature ones, they don't have any branches sort of below, I don't know, six or seven feet. Yeah, that's a good observation. Um, so how long ago did you plant the live oak? 
uh, probably about 10 years. Oh, 10 years. Okay. Uh, and how is the growth on it on top look? Pretty good? Yeah, great. Uh, it has put on almost a foot of fresh growth so far this year. Okay. I would cut everything off right up against the trunk, and I would cut it off. Um, is there a lawn under around this live oak? Uh, some of them have lawn. Some of them have a uh, mulch bed, as you recommend, around them. Okay. So generally, we prune limbs up pretty high. Like uh, if I were to hold a pair of loppers in my hand uh, and hold them kind of up above my head about that high. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, if a branch starts just at head height for you, by the time it gets out there and sags down, you can't get a lawnmower under it. You know, I mean, it, it, it'll hit you in the head trying to walk around and mow. So we have to start up higher than that uh, with the branches. And uh, if you look at the beautiful live oaks, you know, around town, on campus, whatever, uh, surprising how high those branches are starting. And so I would I would prune all of that out. If it were a brand new tree, for anyone who's listening that has a, a fairly new in the last year transplant or two, well, then those we often tip those branches and leave them because they have leaves on them and they can help fuel the growth of the tree. And then once they get about the size of, oh, certainly less than a golf ball, just a little between golf ball and thumb size, let's say, we go ahead and cut them off. Um, but in tipping them kind of dwarfs them. But on a tree 10 years in that's doing really well, you don't need to worry about that at all. I would just cut everything off that's not going to be a permanent limb on the tree. And that would include if you have some narrow branches up in the canopy that uh, are going to end up as they grow bigger, uh, pushing each other apart, uh, then I would take those one, or, one of those out also. Okay. Uh, it was either, I heard it from you or my dad, which was anything that is, going to smack you in the face as you walk past it yeah feel free. yeah that's right and you got to think forward in time i mean you know live oaks are huge in time and so something that's higher than you can reach with a pair of loppers standing on the ground when it gets out to the end of that branch it's probably going to be slapping you in the face as you said um and so we just kind of have to work and train with them but don't don't start don't be tempted to start them too low okay and would you recommend uh pruning them in fall like most other trees or you know here in the Bryan College Station area we don't have a uh, significant like active uh, oak wilt centers they have occurred from time to time we've had like it'll pop up over here or pop up over there but we don't have that situation like you do in central Texas where uh, summer pruning is a is a little bit risky uh, and so I would go ahead and prune them but if you want to we normally don't spray pruning cuts, but if you want to be extra careful, just the minute you cut off a branch, spray it with a pruning compound. And that seals that wound. And once it's had, you know, a few days or so, uh, a week to kind of dry out, then it's not going to be something that, that would be attractive to a beetle carrying oak wilt. Uh, we're just trying to get them past that stage. And that allows us to prune a little bit here and there all through the year. If you're going to do severe major pruning, I would save that for late winter. So do, you know, just a little bit, maybe once a month or something like that? Yeah, that be that would be fine. It's just okay. you don't want to, let, I don't know an exact number here, but let's just say you wouldn't want to remove a third or 40% of all the foliage at one time. You know, that that's yeah. what I mean by major pruning uh, in the summertime. And so, uh, yeah. And then just try to try to cut them right at the shoulder, so they don't sprout from there. Uh, at the at the shoulder of where the branch attaches is what you're describing. Yeah, that little. Yeah. So if you watch on a live oak or in most trees, if you watch as the branch comes in toward, let's say, the trunk, whatever it's attached to, the trunk. It, it's a certain diameter, and then as it gets close, depending on how big the branch is, uh, it starts to flare out and attaches to the trunk kind of in a much larger area than the diameter of the original branch out there. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Right where it begins to get bigger, right about there is where you would cut it off. So that avoids leaving a stub, which will die, and then the dead interior prevents the wound from closing back over. Uh, and it also avoids creating big wounds, because if you think about it, uh, as it starts to flare out to attach to the trunk, the closer to the trunk you cut, the bigger that 
wound circle is going to be, right? And so we want to get it as small as we can, which is about the, where it starts to flower out. That's a good place to make your cut. Great. Thank you. And uh, do I have time for one more question? Sure. For you? Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, your feelings about uh, pine shavings as mulch. And I'm talking about sort of animal bedding, so like a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. what, what, are you, what are you mulching? A large ornamental bed. Okay. Um, what I've heard is that any wood-based mulch put on top will tie up soil at the first where it contacts the soil. Yes. And I'm going to put it on pretty thick. Yeah. So I didn't have to not be able to amend in future years. Um, so my question is, if I added in some nitrogen source like uh, chicken manure or cow manure, yeah. would that help it break down faster? Yeah, it would. I'd, I'd throw that, you know throw a little little bit of mulch down an inch or so and throw the chicken manure in there and then cover it up with more mulch that, you know, to keep that chicken manure from being out on top or whatever. Uh, here, here's the thing. There, there's First of all, there's two terms, and, and you're using it correctly, but a lot of people read about wood causing nitrogen tie-up, and that's true if you've used wood as a soil amendment meaning I've mixed it into the soil, like you would compost. Uh, but if the wood is a mulch, that term means I put it on top of the ground, like a blanket over the soil, then the only place that it can tie up is, as you indicated, that interface between the mulch and the soil. That tie-up is pretty minor. It's not like the mulch on top of the soil is sucking nitrogen out four inches deep in the soil. It, that's not what's happening. It's just as the microbes start to break down that woody mulch on the surface where the soil contacts the mulch, yeah, they need some nitrogen to be able to break down wood, that high carbon material. And your chicken manure would do that. A little sprinkling of, of a nitrogen fertilizer would do that. But, you know, I found when you just use it as a mulch, in most cases, it's just not a concern. And uh, some research done up at Washington State, I mean, they, they actually are recommending people just use that stuff that power line, uh, trimmer companies grind up and blow into the back of the of the truck. Uh, and that's just a raw wood mulch, but they're just piling it really high. And when we do our earth kind rose research at Texas A&M up in Dallas, uh, they just use wood chips, just plain old wood chips right on the surface. And so I wouldn't worry about it. But okay. if you want to be extra, extra careful, you could put a little nitrogen around it. But I don't, I don't think you're going to see a problem at all. Yeah, because the, the animal sort of pine shavings are one-third the price of the the bagged mulch that yeah. you can buy. Yes. The, the, the concern I have is that the bed, the volume of soil has shrunk mm -hmm. because I've used, I've uh, made raised beds with garden soil and it got whatever it does that mm -hmm. it shrinks. Uh, so I know in future seasons I'm going to want to add more compost. Yeah. So can I put the compost on top of the pine shavings or do I need to move them away? Well, well, I would, now I would move them out. Uh, here's the thing on the pine shavings. We've gone from a big old chunk of wood, like I was describing uh, before, yep. to a very thin, lots of surface area per volume uh, piece of wood with a shaving. And so you do have more potential contact with the soil. And so if you're putting things on that, uh, I could see there would be a tie up. I would probably rake them back. But you need to watch those two and see how they behave in the garden. You know, uh, chunky mulch stays open, allows oxygen into the soil, and, and takes time to decompose, which is all good. Uh, and the shavings, you may find they kind of mat up on the surface. I don't know. I've never used them. So, uh, But my just thinking about it, it would be like, well, I don't know. Are you going to like that as a mulch? And so that would be my only thing to think about. Yeah, from what I saw, the reason I did this is because it was cheap, and then I mixed in three different particle sizes, basically. You can get fine, you can get coarse, and then I also mixed in cedar, which is a little bit more expensive, but much more chunky. Okay. I think for the exact reason that you're just describing, so it does not mat up. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, and so if you did want to add compost or bring the soil bed level up later, as long as it's not a, a bed full of shrubs, which you'd have to dig those up to amend the soil, um, 
then I would just pull that mulch back, but take a look at it, but th and then put it back because mulch decomposes. And some people think you got to pull out the old mulch to put on fresh new mulch. And no, you don't. The forest doesn't do that. Think about the forest floor. It drops new mulch on top of the old mulch. And that old mulch decomposing will release those nutrients back. You know, we're talking about tying up nitrogen. Those microbes do use some nitrogen, but then they die and their bodies release that nitrogen back too. And the decomposing material, uh, you sort of reach a cycle there where you're, you know, it, it's not like the nitrogen is just gone. It's just being tied up in the bodies of microbes or, or other things like that. Okay, well, great. I, I think I've taken up enough of your time and you probably got a line of people. So thank well, you very much. I appreciate that call, thank you. Our, phone, right. our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. And let's go to the emails here. Got some email to cover here today. I had an email from Veronica. And uh, I believe Veronica was putting mulch down the garden paths to create an all-weather pathway. And the question was, is there any special kind you should use? Is it safe for the plants and so on? And the answer is, yes, you can do that. Uh, I have created gardens where I scooped out the walkways and put it up in the bed so I'd have a taller raised bed. And I filled those, what amounts to then a trench, with leaves, ground up leaves. I've used wood chips in those before. They take longer to decompose, but uh, just organic matter and let it decompose. And it does create a nice all weather pathway. And then at the end of a period of time, and it depends on, you know, leaves decompose faster than wood chips and uh, ground up leaves that you've run over with a mower decompose even faster than leaves that haven't been ground up. But uh, probably with leaves that have been kind of run over with a mower about twice a year, you kind of have recycled that that garden walkway. And um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. One is just keep adding stuff on top and never do anything about it down in the walkways. Uh, the other is I would get a wheelbarrow with a little screen, like a half-inch hardware cloth type screen, and just scoop the walkways out, put them on the the screen, kind of shake it, and you get a nice fine compost down in that wheelbarrow. And then you can dump the leaves back in there and add more leaves on top of them. The same is true with wood chips. I've had wood chip pathways where after time, even those chips, those chunky chips are decomposing. And I pull the dry chips on the surface back, scoop out all that stuff that's decomposing on the bottom, run it through a little screen. You can make a little two by four uh, frame that holds the screen that sits on top of a wheelbarrow. And you get some really good stuff, really good stuff. And it's kind of like harvesting your walkways. And so uh, you, you might want to think about that. Uh, that that's a, a pretty legit way uh, to compost because, you know, composting can be a little bit of work if you're, if you're turning it all the time and you're sticking thermometers in it to keep the temperature at a certain place and stuff. Well, organic matter just decomposes. They say compost happens, and uh, that's true. It happens in the forest and meadows and everywhere else. And so, yeah, you can never never take out the old stuff. Just add new stuff to the surface if it needs to be, you know, freshened up or if it's getting too thin. Just, just throw more on the top. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, and we are now going to go talk to Bill. Hello, Bill. Hey, Jeff. I, I want to uh, talk butter beans today. Uh, you know, great, great crop. I love them, but I have a uh, problem is with uh, bloom set, and uh, I'm trying to figure out if the problem is my preference for uh, pole varieties instead of bush varieties. Because I've tried uh, Christmas, and this year I have King of the Garden. You know, great vines wonderful sprays of blooms and then very poor bloom set. Okay. But I have noticed if I can uh, nurse them through the summer and get them to the fall, they do set just fine. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was hoping you or one of your listeners had some uh, recommendation for a pole butter bean that uh, sets fruit in the spring. Well, that's a good question. I've used uh, Henderson bush before as, as a bean. Uh, there's one called 
Mr. Story's butter bean. It's one of those that the seeds are shared among gardeners. I don't think I've ever seen it in a garden center or a seed catalog, but uh, a, a couple things could be happening. It, it could be certainly cool weather uh, can affect bloom set when it's too cool at night, uh, but hot weather can also affect bloom set on our various kinds of beans, butter beans, bush beans, and so on. Mm. It gets really hot and they, they just don't set as well. So if you can get a bunch to set, then you usually can harvest that crop. And I think what's happening in the fall is you're getting a little bit of break in the heat. And then here comes some more blooms and, and you get a good bloom set. I'm not aware, Bill, of a variety to recommend as a heat tolerant one. Maybe some other gardener uh, is listening and could call in or one of our uh, vegetable specialists, someone from, from the work right. department uh, is listening in. They may be able to, to uh, straighten me out on this a little bit. But other than other than that and maybe excessive ni nitrogen or, you know, really rich soil, uh I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. Well, uh, it's part of the problem is my huge preference. Is that, uh, you know, any, anything I can put on a trellis, I do. And um, the varieties listed on variety recommendations on Haggy, Haggy Horticulture are mm -hmm. the uh, bush. They're, they're all bush. So okay. Uh, I might be just forced to start growing bush ones. <laughs> Well, I don't think so. I mean, I've had a little time to research it. I might, we might be able to find something, something else that you would try. I am not a pole butter bean grower, and so I, I love butter beans, but I just have never tried the, the pole type. Uh, and so I'm not going to be able to just tell you, well, here's the variety I grow. Okay. Well, I understand. Uh, I do have another question. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I go uh, much more than we can eat, so I invite friends over to share and all that. And I also start uh, a lot of pots of dill and basil to give to them, to let them take home. And uh, last week I had a friend come over, and so uh, he took some. And I he always instruct him, put them in the ground, and they'll do fine. But he texted me this morning. He said the dill was completely gone. And... Uh, since I have never had any problem with any uh, critter bothering my deal, I just uh, th thought I'd ask you. Well, completely gone. And he didn't see yeah. caterpillars on it? it no. It said, and uh, no sign of activity in the dirt either. Just uh, it it's gone. Well, well there, there are, caterpill there are uh, caterpillars that will eat dill. I think, I believe the... The swallowtail butterflies, they're larva-like dill. I may be wrong. About it. I'd have to look that one up. But, yes, there's a butterfly. The caterpillars eat dill. But uh, you would see them. You would watch them grow up on the dill from little caterpillars to big ones. That almost sounds like a deer or some. You know what I'm saying? Some other yeah. thing. If, if it's truly going to chomp away and it's gone and there's no, no sign of anything, uh, that sounds like something else beyond the insect world. Yeah, well, I, I thought of rabbits, but, uh, you know, I have rabbits in my place, too. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, they've never bothered me. But uh, Okay. When, when a plant is uh, completely gone, uh, at my place, it's usually a gopher that's pulled it underground. Okay. <laughs> you must have sandy <laughs> soil out there. I, I have a I have a wonderful loam that's uh, soft enough, you know, loose enough for gophers to love. And, okay. But, yeah, yeah, they're... I, you know, they they get a lot. They're uh, they especially love cilantro, by the way. Oh, do they? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate talking to you. I'll uh, pass it on. Okay, to my friend. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to go now to Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, Skip. Recently, I was visiting in the Austin area, and we ID'd a very young tree as a white mulberry. Aggie horticulture says it's an invasive species. But surely there are other mulberries that aren't invasive. Isn't that true? Well, I invasive um, is a kind of unique word. And, and if it's not from this area and it proliferates and pushes out native vegetation, that's what we think of as invasive. Uh, you know, native elms 
will reseed in your flower beds and come up everywhere in your garden and they become a weed and but they're not considered invasive because they're native here uh, and so that that's an oversimplification but uh, mulberries are eaten by birds and when the birds yeah. poop out the seeds you're going to get mulberries coming up and so i uh you know i guess you could say they're that if they're not from here they're going to be invasive but that's that's just the nature of that species. Oh, I see. Well, we noticed like three or four of them coming up in the flower garden. Okay. Well, and who knows where those came from. I mean, a bird could have flown a distance in and, and dropped the seeds off. But um, it, it's just something you kind of learn what they look like when they sprout up. And you, when they're young, it's very easy to pull them up. Okay, so that's probably what we should do. I, I think so. That's what I would do because they, they, they can become a woody weed. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your advice. We'll okay. get to it then. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Uh, let's now go to the phones. Again, the number is 979-845-5689. And we're going to talk to Jake. Hello, Jake. Hey, Skip. Hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, shoot, man. Uh, I'm like a little curveball here. I was honestly curious to see, it's kind of a broad question, but what does fungal infections look like to you? Uh, uh, do we have a particular kind of plant? Uh, kale, to be exact. So the main fungal problem with kale that is a real problem is something called black rot. And this is true of cabbage. This is true of broccoli. That whole blue leaf vegetable family uh, can get black rot. And black rot shows up as kind of angular yellow spots that end up turning brown on the leaves. And, and angular because because the veins create an, you know, a little V or an angle as the veins come together. And you'll typically get the black rot somewhat confined by those veins that are going by, the leaf veins. The, 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 right, right. The, and so th that's why it has an angular look. But that's a problem because you got to get all that dead residue out of there. Uh, don't don't put those in your compost pile. But it's a very persistent disease, can be, can be carried on through dead material in the soil. And so that would right. be one, if you have it, you want to get all you can out of the, out of the area and move on. Sometimes it comes in with our transplants. Uh, we hope they don't, but sometimes they do. So, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, um, this, this is actually with uh, aquaponics set up. Uh, it's been a while since I talked to you. It's probably been a good year now, but uh, we're out between Cameron and Calvert. Okay. Got about four greenhouses with probably 1,000 to 1,200 heads of kale at the moment okay and, uh, it, the these per, this particular damage on the kale leaves it looks very similar to what oh uh, what is it called forgot the particular species but uh, aphids you know how they can eat like a lure kind uh, of eat, eat what i missed that word aphids that but you're saying they can eat and then i didn't hear after the word eat Oh, like they, um, they, you know, like they break down, if I'm not mistaken, they kind of break down the first layer of a leaf. It kind of looks like it's getting sucked out. In some instances, it looks almost transparent, the damage. Okay. Well, bacterial diseases will cause it to get kind of water-soaked initially and then dry out to a very thin, tan whitish tan area so that's one thing that could happen there's also insects caterpillars when they're very young their mouth parts aren't big enough to eat the whole leaf right, so right. they'll just eat the spongy materials on top of most of the veins and each time they molt they get bigger jaws and they can eat more so either of those could fit your description a little bit yeah, i was also thinking man it's it's just that uh, I guess what I'm going off of right now is I haven't caught any aphids or yeah. caterpillars yet in yeah. houses. They're, what caterpillars there are are much larger. I've been treating them with a BT, and that seems to be doing a trick. But yeah. I don't know. It's kind of uh, – I'll, I'll, I'll say this. It's mostly damage to the older leaves on the bottom. And okay. Now, they're not submerged in water. 
Okay. I tell you what, uh, you know, Jake, I think I need to get you to take some close-up pictures with your camera phone and uh, make sure they're in sharp focus and uh, email them to me. And let me look. Show me the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf, so I can see what you're seeing. For sure, for sure. Uh, the alternative would be to pick some leaves, put them in a Ziploc bag, and drop them off at the AgriLife Extension office. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to be moving out or going out of town, and so I won't be back until Monday. Uh, so you would want to do that next week, if you want to oh, drop off. Right now, okay. If you want to drop off samples, otherwise, just send me some pictures and I'll take a look at them. Oh, for sure. No, I completely crossed my mind. I forgot y'all actually plant this. That's neat. Uh, I'll yeah. run that by my boss. Uh, yeah. Do what he wants to do, but I'll definitely send some pictures. What was your email again? Uh, I tell you what, send those pictures to R R I C H T E R R Richter at ag.tamu.edu. And that's to my office, and uh, I check the radio email on Thursdays, but I'm not checking it during the week, so until I get back in the station. All right, sir. I uh, appreciate it, man. All right. Take care. Look forward to helping you further. Yes, sir. Good deal. Thank you. You bet. Uh, our phone number, 979-845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Now let's go to the phones and talk to Stacy. Hello, Stacy. Hi, Skip. I got two for you today. Well, good. Thanks uh, for waiting, by the way. <laughs> oh, no, you're all good. So I planted a bunch of new fruit trees this year, and one was a pineapple pear. Okay. And I'm always scared you to hear about fire blight. And it's starting to get some of, not any of the new growth, but like a lot of the, some of the edges of some of the leaves are getting brown. Okay. It's like a crispy brown, not like soaked brown. And I didn't know if that was fire bite starting or if there's another disease that could affect. It's not like the whole tree yet, but it's just enough for me to notice. Well, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like fire blight starting. Fire blight primarily is a problem in the spring. Uh, when it gets real hot, we don't see as much of the fire blight problems. On that marginal uh, burn on the leaf that you're describing. I I am familiar with what you're talking about, and I don't know exactly what is causing that. When when a a plant lacks water, uh, you can often get browning on the edges of the leaf. I saw a bunch of crepe myrtles last year around Bryan College Station that were in parking lot islands, and when we got hot and dry, they started showing that tip and margin burn. Uh, another thing that can cause it is excessive amount of nitrogen, that uh, when a salt-based fer uh, synthetic fertilizer burns roots, you can get a similar symptom to that. I seriously doubt that's what's going on with your pear, though. Uh, so I would, um, yeah, I think that's that's probably what, what I would look to. I, I don't think you need to treat anything. I, I certainly not at this point a spray needed just watch it and see and again okay. photos are always helpful that way i'm sure we're talking about the same thing but i'm i'm 90 percent sure i know what you're talking about on this one okay well at least with all the rain i don't have to worry about the watering for a couple at least a week probably yeah yeah that's right that's right <laughs> and then the other question i've always asked it every year but it, you never know new year new new answer i'm starting to see grasshoppers already any good bait treatments that can go out for that um do you live next to a, like a grass pasture or yeah i live in the i live just outside of town okay yeah you know if it was your yard and you were in town and you you can put a bait out there's a bait called no low bait you spread it mm -hmm. on the ground and when grasshoppers hatch out the little nymphs don't have wings and they're just hopping around down there and so uh the nolo bait is very effective, but the problem when you're next to a big pasture is you got grasshoppers hatching out out there and then coming onto your property. So you spreading nolo bait on the ground isn't going to do any good at all uh, for grasshoppers because they're they're migrating in, and that would just be uh, some you know you would just use a a general purpose insecticide to kill them as they come in. I know that's a, a not a great answer because you're spraying and spraying and spraying because the new ones are always coming in. But that that's kind of what you're limited to. I used to tell people use row cover fabric over plants you especially want to protect or not spray. But uh, I'm, some people have told me they even eat on the row cover fabric. I haven't had that happen, but I. I well, something was eating the top of a couple of my tomato twigs, and I didn't see a I didn't see evidence for a worm. But yeah. it could have also been 
they usually don't butter the tomatoes first. So I'm like, don't think. But I'm worried about my corn because my corn, my first planting of corn is just starting to silk out. Yeah. So I well, don't want them to eat the silk. To, out to, the to corn. mine, yeah. To my knowledge, grasshoppers don't eat tomatoes. Now someone may call and correct me on that, but I've never seen it up to now. Now what does eat tomatoes are tomato hornworms and tobacco hornworms yeah, I was both. For those and I- any yet i mean i could always just do a preemptive bt spray though too yeah you have to look careful i mean you'll see all these leaves missing and you don't see them but you keep looking and you find the guy uh but maybe a bird came along and and took care of it for you uh it, it could be old damage and not an ongoing concern yeah and then is dill really sensitive to wet feet uh i've never tried to grow it in too wet of soil but i you know, well, the rain we got, it kind of looked like it melted. Yeah, some of the some of those plants don't. A lot of plants don't like uh, oversaturated soil, especially if it's like a clay and it just doesn't drain well. There's not a lot of of uh, air space in the soil to begin with, and then it gets too wet. So it could be that. It could be a um, some sort of a a blight type disease on the top part that just being very wet uh, gave it. Well, it's really healthy, except for the except for the swallowtail caterpillars i've been pulling off constantly yeah um until the rain came this last week and i just got a ton of it and it's uh, the dill and the chamomile just kind of look like they melted a little bit. uh well that that could that could well be yeah one of these days i'm gonna get raised beds in but i haven't figured out the best way to put in raised beds over an area that has um nuts edge oh yeah yeah getting rid of the nuts edge is a good idea <laughs> I just don't know how I'm able to get rid of it. It's like a carpet in the summer. I just basically mow it. <laughs> okay. Well, there are sprays that will kill it, uh, but you have to stay with it. Uh, Nutsedge, wh- what we do, I say we, that's gardeners in general, uh, homeowners in general. What we do is we spray it, and it kills back, and then it comes back again, and, you know, we just get frustrated. We don't spray it for a while. Then we go back in and spray it. And, and all we're doing is just kind of burning the tops off. We're not really getting rid of it. And uh, if you, if I can get nerdy here with you on a plant thing, if you take one nuts edge nut that comes out of winter and pops up and here's this new, new plant that's come out of the nut, and if you don't do anything to it until now, sometime in May, it probably has eight daughter plants that have hit the point where they now are viable underground nuts. So you have at least you know, eight times as much nuts edge just by not acting promptly. If you knock it back and then it comes back again, it pretty quickly can regrow. And so it's just one that you just have to stay on it. And every time you see it and it's got three, three to five leaves, it needs to be dug, sprayed, something. Well, it's a little too big of an area for that. I didn't know if it was, if it was solarizing, it would help at all this summer. It, nuts edge can be deep enough to where solarizing wouldn't work. I would think that if you had some nuts that were up in the top three inches or four of the soil, solarizing might might stand a chance uh, to, to, to helping with those. But uh, most of the nuts, I think, are going to be a little too deep for solarizing to work. Okay, well, worth a shot. Like I said, it's just kind of, this year's been very wet and very weird. Yeah, <laughs> well, every year's weird in its own way. That's for well, sure. So many Anna apples, you wouldn't believe it. Okay. My is crazy loaded. I have no idea what this year is different unless it just didn't like the freeze last December and just decided, like, I'm going to put a lot of fruit out because I've never had this many before. I mean, it's just... Well, that's good. I mean, do, yeah, it's good. It's just like, wow. Do so you have another Do you have another um, variety of apple or just Anna? Yeah, I have um, is it Tropic Sweet or something. like it's Tropic something. came from Florida. Okay. My friends got it from me years ago so it's been there for a couple of years but it's finally starting to get bigger too okay and, it had a few, and they were blooming at the same time because i got rid of all my other apple trees because they weren't blooming at the right time okay so i cut everything else down so i added the pear and plums and more peaches and yeah. kept it because it was the biggest and it was giving me a few apples but nothing like this year this year's just crazy uh-huh. yeah well good oh. that's good time to all make right. an apple pie well, that or applesauce or something else like that. Maybe apple chip. <laughs> There's going to be a lot, a lot of different apple options. All right. Well, that sounds like a good plan. All right. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Appreciate the call. Our phone number is, uh, oh, that was Stacy. <laughs> uh, Susan, how are you? What can we good. talk about? I, I'm good. I, well, I have two, two questions, one very fast. I'm growing fairy tale eggplant, and I have never grown it before. It's about a finger 
length long now, mm-hmm. is that ready to pick? No. Fairy tale will get about, I would probably let it get maybe six to eight inches long before I picked oh. it. Uh, okay. I'm trying to remember there's Hansel and Fairy Tale. They're both out of the same breeding line. That's why they have names like Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and, okay. and Fairy Tale. Uh, and I'm trying to remember which is which now because I've grown both of those. But by the way, they're very good and very productive. Nice eggplants. Uh, eggplant, you want to pick. You want to let it get a decent size. It's kind of like a green bean. You can eat a green bean when the flower falls off, and it's a you know half inch long. Um, right. But you're not going to get good production eating all your green beans right. at that size. So we want to get them big enough, but we also don't want to let them go past where the skin gets tough. And typically, they're going to have a glossy skin. And as they get, you know, they're getting too. If you see the skin kind of turning dull, you probably let it go a little too far. Uh, and so, or it's, especially, I think brown. I've seen that it's an actual eggplant growing for three days now. Okay, well, so it's now finger length. Yeah, on so the third day, you're early. You're you're early to pick it. I, let them okay. go, and and you'll, right. you'll learn. You know, every variety of any vegetable is, is a little different, and so okay. uh, learning. You know, how do you know when a green? If it's one of those varieties of tomatoes that doesn't turn red or orange right. how do you know when it's time to eat it well that's true. Uh, it so you just kind of have to get used to what you're growing but i the ones i had i'm pretty sure yeah they were i probably had them eight inches long before i picked them okay all right i've never seen them in the store either so that's why i'm like i have no idea well they're great my they're great second f- question they're great for containers is, too by the way yeah it is in a container well mm-hmm. i have them in three different places some are in the ground some are in containers so that particular one is in a container right now but okay my other question is, with this, all the storms that happen, I have a very large live oak tree, um, and it got struck by lightning. Mm-hmm. It's chewed up, and I had a pecan tree several years ago get struck by lightning, and we didn't really do anything to it, and it really kind of split open. This live oak tree is right in my yard, and so what do you think that we should maybe spray some you know, um, sealer in it and then wrap it to keep it together. What is, what should no, you do when the lightning hits a tree? Yeah. I think after the fact, there's really nothing to do. Uh, certainly not wrapping it up. I don't think, uh, sealing in general, we don't worry about sealing wounds. Uh, you know, I, I talked earlier about oak wilt when you're pruning, you know, doing right. that, but this this has already happened. There have been some days that have passed, so it's kind of a little late anyway. Uh, and it's just not practical to seal the splits from a lightning strike. Uh, the tree will start to heal over. Uh, uh, I shouldn't use the term heal. Close the wound back over it. It forms a callus and it closes back over the wound. Uh, and so that's going to take a while. Uh, is this a pretty large live oak? Yes, yes. It's yeah. very large. So large live oaks... Uh, they don't have the vigor generally that a young tree would. And so it may be a very slow process. And you may be dealing with eventually having some decay access that inner wood before the wound closes. And so anything you can do to maintain good health and vigor of your tree. Uh, certainly we go into another one of these summers where for 100 days it's, or for 45 days it's over 100 degrees and it doesn't rain. Well, that would be a good time to supplement, you know, some good soakings of the soil. Uh, but it's going to be a wait wait and see. You might want to hire an arborist to come out take a look at it and see what they notice. They may see something that I'm not picturing in my mind's eye, and, and they may have a, a little additional advice for you on it. Okay. Well, we just didn't know if we should do something. It was this week, but it's, yeah. Yeah, it's like chewed up, and it's a straight line, and it. I heard it. It sounded like a bomb went off yeah. in my yard. <laughs> it was so. Anyway, all right. Well, well so I so basically, to... basically, what happens in one of those strikes, and it's kind of interesting if you think about it. Uh, it's like the the electricity. So much of it goes through that it turns the water into vapor instantly. And so think of about a popcorn kernel. Inside is a little moisture, and you heat it to a point where the water goes from liquid state to gas state and it just explodes the kernel that's what's happening all the way down that strip of bark so it is a very (laughs) it's not a great pruning job right i mean it's not a nice clean cut it's literally exploded off 
And, it is, and yeah. so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, after the fact, there's just not a lot of, you can't go backwards in time, unfortunately. Okay. Well, we just, we thought we'd check to make sure, like, what we should do. But I appreciate your advice, and maybe we'll have, um, I know my husband will probably get the county extension agent out here and see if what he thinks, too, because it's like, it's an important tree. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I no. would I would talk to an arborist if you can get get one on the phone in town yeah. and have them we'll have see. them do a site. We're, yeah, we're country people. I doubt there's an arborist anywhere near here. Well, they they so. will travel uh, some distance. Okay. So, and, All right. and well, a, va- we'll a valuable tree might be might be worth that cuz you know, yeah. I I could walk out and look at the tree and go, "Yep, you're right. That was lightning strike." But as yeah. far as, you know, giving it long-term care and stuff, that's where that's where having a service like that that can provide that care will be will be helpful. Okay. All well, right. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate the call. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, you're listening to Guard Success, and we are a call-in show as I guess you have noticed by now. 979-845-5689 and also by email. Also by email. And uh, let's see, talking about email. Well, let let me first go and take a call here. Uh, Let's go to the phones and talk to Cecil. Hello, Cecil. Hey, how you doing there, sir? I'm I'm well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I went went by the uh, AgriLife building, and I was in a a little golf court, and I went through uh, 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 your garden area. Okay. And uh, I do believe there was a big, huge rose of Sharon bush there that had like maybe 50 60 blooms and it's kind of a purplish blue yes uh and uh how long will that bloom and where do i park so we can go look at it up close now you're talking about the building up on highway 21 north Bryan. no no i'm talking over there at a&m campus oh oh the horticulture building yes are you talking about the, the gardens on campus okay if you go to the gardens webpage uh, if you go to the web page, there's a place where they talk about where you can park, but it's on weekends that yeah. and and the parking is is free in certain places. You need to find make sure you're in the right lot, but that would allow you to walk through and see and everything like that. Um, other than that, you you would have to use a parking garage or or pay parking that near the gardens. There's some paid parking spots where you say I need an hour or two hours or whatever, and you just you pay that way, uh, but okay. you're, you're you're so I'm 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 probably not answering fully the question. So try me again. What what else is it that you want to know about it? Oh uh, yeah, my wife says that she can't find uh, any rose of Sharon in the nurseries around here, and she likes rose of Sharon, so we're trying to find some. Okay, so a producers co-op and a farm patch uh, down south toward Brenham. Antique Rose Emporium. I would call these places before I went. Uh, Antique Rose Emporium may have it. I, I know that they have them out at Arbor Gate and Tomball, and that's quite a drive uh, to get out there. Mm-hmm. But it's it's well worth the trip, by the way. It's amazing, then, uh, amazing do they place. Kind of different color? Uh, other close by might be, and this isn't that close, but uh, up at um, oh, what's the little town Buffalo on high, Interstate 45. You kind of cut back through the. Uh, you know, uh, the woods uh, or the countryside going back up um, Normandy and all those those kind of little towns uh, there's a place called Bobos and they have a lot of things out there uh, but I think I'd if I couldn't find them locally I think I'd try Arbor Gate because they, they do have a good uh, selection and I'm trying to think of the name of the one it has, has blue in the name uh, let's see hang on just a second I'll find it was there anything else in your question uh, and, and how many different colors do the uh, Rose of Sharon come in? Like uh, red and the, white? D- different shades. There's some white, kind of pinkish uh, color. Uh, the blue and purple is, is a real common one. Uh, and, then you know, in between purple and pink, those kind of colors are pretty common. Let me go to Texas Supers. I think it's called Blue Angel. And that's the one okay. you saw. If you were at the gardens on campus, I know they have at least a couple of Blue Angels out there. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to make sure that I'm telling you the truth here. Just one second. What are you sure? Blue Angel, Althea. By the way, Rose of Sharon is called Althea. Um, but if you, I would call if you want that one. It is a beautiful one, and it's one of our Texas superstar plants. It's been okay. tes- tested okay. by AgriLife Extension. 
All right. Well, I appreciate the information. All right. How big is one of that thing yet? Oh, Over. boy. I would say probably after several years, you're going to be up in the six foot or more range, maybe up to eight feet. Uh, but in general, about six or so. Depending on growing conditions, that'll affect okay. it a lot. Uh, they're all white versions of, of these. And so. But okay. the Blue Angel is just pretty. I love Blue Angel. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the call. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now and talk to Brian. Hello, Brian. Hey, Skip. Hey, just a quick question. I sent it by email. I just want to make sure I caught you today. Was uh, roses. I'm hearing a lot about don't plant new roses we got some virus or something coming down from North Texas. Yeah. I wanted to yeah. hear what your, your thoughts were so, on it. Because so, I'm getting conflicting, conflicting uh, 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 opinions on that. All right. Well, I'll, I'll clarify it for you. Um, so I, I, thanks for following up on that email. Um, so there is, a, there is a disease called Rose Rosette, and it's spread by some little tiny insects that feed on an infected plant with the virus and then they go feed on your rose bush and they transmit it that way. I don't know if it can be transmitted by pruning, pruning a, wound, a sick bush and then pruning a healthy bush. I, I, I would worry that it could. I, I don't know for sure that it can. But rose rosette is one that when you see it, you pull that rose up and you uh, expect roses around it. Keep a close eye on them because it's very contagious. Uh, and so what you do is when you have it on a rose bush, you put a like a big trash bag over the rose bush and like pull a drawstring or whatever at the bottom. So when you pull up that bush, you're not shaking loose all the little bugs that that would have it in their system, because then they just fly off and and infect sure. other roses. So it, it's that serious of a disease. We already have it here. Uh, it's it's it started. In Texas, we noticed it first up in the Dallas area, but it, it goes goes way beyond that now. Oh, boy. So what's a good substitute that's, you know, from, so all roses are out is what I'm hearing. Uh, pretty much, yeah. They're, uh, Dr. Byrne with Texas A&M, uh, agri the horticulture department, has been breeding to, to try to develop a rose rosette resistant varieties. And sure. uh, so, I, you know, I don't know the exact status of all that right now. I know that there's not like a variety release that you go out and buy yet. Uh, but they're working on it. It's a serious thing. The Houston Rose Society, which is a huge rose society, is very concerned about it. And uh, so uh, right now you can plant whatever rose variety you want. You just don't want to have an infected rose nearby. That's, that's the bottom line. So yeah. knockouts, you know, they're planted everywhere. So some people say, well, knockout gets it real bad. Well... Yeah, but it, everywhere is a knockout, so it, it, sure. you're you're, you're going to see it on knockout more than other roses because there are ten times more knockouts than than other sure, roses. Sure. So that, any substitute to the knock to the roses all together, big flowery something that uh, for local here in College Station. A substitute. I'm sorry, I didn't follow the question. Yeah, a substitute instead of planting roses, what oh. else can I plant that I normally would have put in a in a in a bed? Uh, that I'd usually put a rose or knockout. Any substitutes that well, I don't have that do, for the roses? Do you, do you have, have you had rose rosette at your house or to your knowledge, no, do any of your neighbors? No. Then I'd plant roses. Uh, they're, oh, still, okay. they're still good plants. I have them at my house and, you know, there's, you know, there's no problem. It's just if your neighbor brought a rose home with rose rosette and planted it, well, now you've got typhoid Mary next door. And so that's, oh, yeah. then that, that oh, would yeah. be the concern, but no, it, we should not stop planting roses at all. We just need to and, know what it looks like, watch for it, and then act quickly, uh, and rogue out anything that that's sick. And what would I see as a symptom? Like no, no petals or what would uh, I see uh, as a symptom? The growth is abnormal. And, uh, what, no, one way that it's abnormal is um, it's very thorny. You know, rather than just the normal rose thorns, um, uh -huh. it it's like just a proliferation of little. It's just an, almost like a, a, the stems are shaggy with um, with thorns uh, out at the new growth. And I'm trying to what is the website? It, is, it, is it rose roserosette.org? If you go to roserosette.org, you okay. can see 
a lot of information. You'll see samples of or pictures of what it looks like. There's there's often kind of a you know new rose growth can be burgundy to begin with, but there's often a little bit more of that. Uh, and just the shaggy proliferation, we call it witch's broom, where it's like all the buds try to sprout at once. Uh, and it's a real, real shaggy look. But uh, go to that website, and I think that will, that will be your best bet for getting right. ideas of what it looks like. I appreciate it as always. All right, Brian, thank you for the call. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Well, we're about out of time for today. Too late for another call, but I will go to the emails. Uh, Ernest. Ernest listens out in the Katy, Texas area, and he has a 12-inch live oak, 12-inch trunk live oak. So that's a good-sized tree. Uh, and it's shedding twigs, little twigs falling out that are one-eighth of an inch, three-sixteenths of an inch, just real real small. And, and the question is, what's going on? The tree looks healthy. It's growing vigorously. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Sometimes in in some areas we get like squirrels just nipping off the ends of shoots and you'll find a bunch of branches on the ground. It could be an elm tree too uh, that that have just been nipped. It's almost like the young squirrels are, I don't know, sharpening their teeth or trying them out or something. Uh, But they'll do things like that. I think that's probably what's happening. There are some little uh, borers that can bore into smaller twigs, but but one-eighth of an inch is almost a little too small for these. But uh, when they do that, that's a weak spot. Uh, if it were bigger branches, we would be looking at a, a, a twig girdler, which is a much larger insect, and it saws about halfway through the branch, and usually it's a pencil-sized branch, all the way around, and then that breaks off and falls to the ground. But when you look at the end of it, it's like someone sawed it off. It's a very clean cut. Uh, but with the size you're talking about and the description you're giving, I'm thinking it's either just some vandal squirrels uh, or possibly uh, some little insect doing the pruning. But it's never going to amount to a big concern. It, it just it is what it is, uh, and nothing to spray, nothing to worry about. Uh, Ernest, I think I think uh, I think that's it. We're listening to Garden Success. Hey, I'll look forward to visiting with you again next Thursday. We're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. We also have a podcast. So whatever your podcast app is, uh, look for Garden Success. And you can listen to past shows or you can go online to the KAMU-FM website, find Garden Success, and listen to past shows there as well. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.